is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Wow, this is a special episode of the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast because not only do I have a guest with me, I actually have two guests today, which is the first time that we're doing this. We have Dr. Elizabeth Wassenaar and Meredith Nesbet, who are coming to us from the Eating Recovery Center. So I'm going to go over both of their bios really quickly right now. Dr. Elizabeth Wassenaar comes to the Eating Recovery Center as medical director in Denver, Colorado. Prior to joining the Eating Recovery Center, she served as a staff psychiatrist and medical director at the Linder Center of Hope with an emphasis on child and adolescent outpatient medication management and therapy. She is board certified in psychiatry and neurology, child and adolescent psychiatry, and obesity medicine. Dr. Wassenaar has completed advanced training in child and adolescent psychotherapy programs, family-based therapy training, and motivational interviewing. She's also a clinical instructor at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and served as the assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati Department of Psychiatry and adjunct assistant professor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center prior to relocating to Denver. In addition to her clinical practice, she's an avid researcher and academic writer in the area of eating disorders. So obviously she is just a really experienced and knowledgeable person to bring on the show. And not only do we have her, but we also have the amazing Meredith Nesbet, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified eating disorder specialist, and member of the clinical response team with the Eating Recovery Center and Pathlight Mood and Anxiety Center, where she enjoys engaging with patients, families, and providers seeking admission nationwide. In addition to her work for ERC and Pathlight and in her private practice, Meredith also provides education and training on weight stigma and health at every size informed care around the country. Meredith earned her bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her master's degree in marriage and family therapy from East Carolina University. Meredith resides in Raleigh, North Carolina, where she spends her free time listening to true crime podcasts, practicing hot yoga and snuggling with her dog, Mac. Wow. I'm so excited to have you both on this show with me today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So the reason I got in touch with you guys is because I really value the work that is done at the Eating Recovery Center. And as a dietitian myself, I'm just aware of some of the work that you guys do. And I am get email newsletters from you guys. And that's that's how I heard about you guys. You guys as Eating Recovery Center puts out continuing education and both of your names popped up in my email inbox. And you were presenting on body acceptance and diversity and mental health, which are definitely going to be some of the focus of our conversation today. But first, I wanted to make something clear for our listeners. And Elizabeth, maybe you wouldn't mind sharing with us a little bit about ERC, Eating Recovery Center, and what it is exactly that that you do. Sure. So, so I'm a regional medical director in the mountain region. So what that means is that I, you know, oversee the medical care and, and clinical fidelity here in Denver. Eating Recovery Center is a large organization across many states. We have integrated care model, which means that we take care of people in the inpatient residential PHP and IOP levels of care for their eating disorders in a multidisciplinary team. So we we try to really meet people where they're at and encourage them to engage in treatment with therapy, family therapy, group therapy 
they work with a dietitian on a meal plan and nutritional restoration or behavioral interruption, and then also have a psychiatrist and uh, an internal medicine or family practice physician that follows them for their psychiatric and, and medical comorbidities. So it's a really integrated and, and multidisciplinary team approach to treating people with eating disorders. Yeah, it, it is amazing when you think about everything that goes into it. I think sometimes, you know, as a dietitian, sometimes people do think, well, it's just, I just need a meal plan. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> we need some therapy. We need some counseling. We, we might need medical intervention too. So those are all of the things that you are providing at ERC. Yeah, that's right. And and it is so important, you know, when you're treating eating disorders that you're making sure that you address the medical comorbidities, the nutritional instability, helping people with behavioral interruption, but then really having a focus on what are the the underlying psychiatric comorbidities that might have precipitated or are maintaining the eating disorder. So, a history of trauma or OCD or anxiety disorders, or really severe depression that hasn't responded well to treatment, and also a lot of family discord. Eating disorders are very difficult on families, understandably. So having people who are experienced with both the individual and family therapy components to help repair both the person and the family is so crucial. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Meredith, I think that's where you come into play quite a bit, right? As As a family, can you tell us a bit about the the work that you do with families that actually when you're treating an eating disorder, yeah, you're not just treating one thing, you're treating multiple people. Yeah, absolutely. So I, in my private practice, I often see families who have an adult loved one with an eating disorder and the family is really struggling to adapt to this person being in a treatment setting. They're not sure how to set boundaries, how to navigate meal times, And so we do a lot of exploration of family dynamics because as a family therapist with systems theory, we know that any change created in the system is going to impact everyone in the system. And so if even if you are just working with parents and the patient with the eating disorder is not in treatment or is, you know, very persistent and not wanting to seek treatment, you can still create change in that family system and you can still help that family improve their relationality and, you know, work with them towards supporting their loved one who has the eating disorder, even if that person's not quite ready to seek treatment. Oftentimes, we find that family or friends, kind of folks chosen family, are the biggest supports that they have in treatment outside of their treatment team. And when they go home and they're no longer in that really structured treatment environment, that chosen family or that blood family really does become kind of the cornerstone of that person's support network and kind of upholds them as they continue to seek recovery or maintain the recovery that they found. Yeah. And it, it is so interesting because like Dr. Wassenaar said, you know, an eating disorder can disrupt an entire family. It can be, it can be uh, traumatic and, and really, it's really hard on everybody. And yet family can be your biggest support system and really help you through and to achieve full recovery. So wow, such important work that you're doing then Meredith. Yeah. I find often that a large part of family therapy is psychoeducation. There's a lot of myths about eating disorders and about what people who have eating disorders look like or act like or when they need treatment and when they don't need treatment. And so a large part of family therapy is psychoeducation and how do we teach them the skill set and just kind of the basic knowledge about eating disorders that they need to help that, that loved one through. Yeah. And this is a perfect time actually to probably go over some basic knowledge then. Um, for, you know, I, I do help a lot of clients with disordered eating, but that might not necessarily be an eating disorder. And, and also an eating disorder isn't, isn't just an and thing. It, there's a lot of different forms and variations of it. Would either of you or both of you like to give kind of just like a high level overview of, of w what the eating disorders are or what it could look like or or why somebody might show up to a place like the Eating Recovery Center? Sure. So, you know, eating disorders are a category of mental illness in the DSM-5 and are really characterized by a disordered eating pattern that is, has become disruptive to uh, your ability to live the life that you want, sort of in a holistic definition. So we know, I think, 
you know, people are typically pretty familiar with the eating disorders, the anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa that involve a drive for thinness and involve some of the disordered behaviors that can really compromise your nutrition. But eating disorders are actually, there's a broader category of eating disorders. So we also see people with binge eating disorder who have loss of control eating, also have a lot of difficulty with, you know, the, their experience of being in their body, a lot of shame and embarrassment around their experience with food, and it's very disruptive to their lives. And then we also see a number of other sort of eating disorders that don't meet one neat diagnostic category, but actually pull behaviors from sort of all over that, again, are often very disruptive and can disrupt your ability to have sort of psychological wellness, mental, uh, or I'm sorry, physical wellness, and also, you know, live your life, medical wellness. And then the last category of eating disorders that we see is actually called ARFID um, and avoidant restrictive feeding and eating disorders. So what that is, is a disorder characterized by people who don't get the enough nutrition, but are not avoiding food because they're trying to lose weight or be thin. So there might be other reasons why people avoid certain kinds of food or food in general. Sometimes people have a fear of choking or swallowing wrong or vomiting that leads them to not want to eat. Sometimes they have some textural issues and, and they can't tolerate certain kinds of food. And more often, we used to diagnose those in children, but we actually know that they happen across the entire lifespan. And can be really complicating parts of other kinds of disorders like OCD or autism spectrum disorder and can really impair one's nutrition. So we treat all of those at Eating Recovery Center and are really, you know, set up to be able to meet people with what their needs are. Yeah, that's that's so many and they all look so different, right? And I like how you kind of mentioned that some of these eating disorders do stem from stem from we never know really the the cause maybe there's not one root cause but might stem from a, a desire of thinness or weight loss but that's not all of them and i think that is important to highlight at the same time i think this is a good time to kind of shift into that conversation about this desire to change our bodies or achieve achieve thinness gosh, where do we begin this conversation? Right? <laughs> um, but so I'm actually, I'm going to, as a sports dietitian, I'm going to start this conversation as it relates to sports. A lot of athletes feel that they need to achieve a certain leanness or a certain number on the scale or a certain muscle to fat ratio in order to achieve their athletic performance goals. And although there, there might be, you know, some level of, you know, muscle helps us perform for sure, but that doesn't necessarily when athletes take it, take it too far and they start manipulating their body or not nourishing their body very quickly, athletes can develop into having an eating disorder. And now they've gone, now they're not helping their performance at all. Right. So I think I'd, I'd first like to bring up this concept that you guys have spoken of before of, of body acceptance. And I'm just going to, as I mentioned to you guys, I'm just going to kind of be blunt here. I'm going to do a little bit of, of, yeah, playing stupid a little bit <laughs> just for the sake of, of hearing from the experts. Like what the heck does body acceptance mean? Because I know that so many athletes that I work with, when they hear body acceptance, they what they hear is you're telling me I could never change my body or like they're saying, well, I did change my body. You know, I'm leaner now than I was before. And like, you just wanted me to accept something else. So would one of you like to give us like the high level overview of what body acceptance really means and how do you combat people who really challenge you to say, what, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not allowed to change my body. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think uh, I would argue that we as a society have something called overvaluation of weight and shape. That phrase is peppered throughout the feeding and eating disorder section of the DSM. And so when we're talking about eating disorders or disordered eating, kind of subclinical things that you might see in outpatient that you're not really sure if it's an eating disorder, overvaluation of weight and shape is going to be there. And so because overvaluation of weight and shape means that we are overly concerned with what our bodies look like, what we weigh, body acceptance has kind of developed as a response to that. So body acceptance for many people who are, you know, in eating disorder treatment, have an eating disorder, or who are just struggling with a disordered eating, the idea of 
kind of body neutrality or body acceptance is really hard. I, so many patients will say, you know, I just don't think I'm ever going to be okay with my body. I, I'm never going to feel like it's good enough. It's never going to be what I want it to be. It's never going to allow me to do what I want to do. And that's really what I call a pain point for them. And so this idea of body neutrality is kind of a spectrum. So like body neutrality leading into body acceptance is a response to that where we say, you know, if I'm working with someone who has this big pain point of like, my body's never going to be what I want it to be. It's never going to be the ideal. It's never going to be good enough. We can say in response to that, okay, so you feel that your body's never going to be good enough. What if we worked on being kind to your body anyway? What if we took that out of the equation and we said, even if you're not totally happy with your body, can you still be kind to yourself? Can you still nourish your body? Can you still move your body? Can you still speak kind words to your body? That's kind of that neutrality piece. And then for some people, that's really where they land. For some people who really struggle with eating disorders, they may never get to body acceptance. And I always talk to people about recovery in the sense that recovery looks different for everyone. And so for one person, body neutrality may be their stopping point. That may be where they land. That may be where they find peace. For other people who have different support systems, different genetics, different you know, treatment, team approaches, they may find a different type of recovery that leads them to body acceptance where, you know, it's the idea that I wake up in the morning and instead of thinking about my body, I can think about so many other things. So it's not that I wake up and think my body is great. I love my body. It's that I wake up and I'm like, huh, what am I going to conquer today? And it, it just gives you back so much brain space. Absolutely. And I love how you kind of created the spectrum of this, of like, you know, body neutrality It's is somewhat different than body acceptance, which then you started to hit on like wait, saying, I love my body. You know, that's like body love or body positivity. But, and all, all of them are good though, because all of them are better than hating or, or not showing your body love or self-harm to your body, right? And I think this is, this is just my personal opinion here. I don't know how you two feel about this, but, you know, in today's day and age with social media, and there is a lot of body positivity messages going around, which is, which is wonderful, but also can have this weird backlash of people then feeling like, well, I don't love my body and feeling worse about themselves for not loving their body. So, what I'm hearing from you, Meredith, that I really want our listeners here is like, it is okay to just be neutral with your body to say, you know what? I might not be totally in love with my body or comfortable, but I can still treat it with love and kindness. I can still nourish it. I can still fuel it. I can still move it and I can be kind to it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I think for a lot of people that just feels like, well, how, how does that work? I've never even thought that that could be a thing. I think we're taught from a very young age that, you know, to, to be successful, to be good, you know, whatever the function of your eating disorder is, that manipulation or changing your body is part of that being good, being liked, being successful. And so to kind of flip that on its head and say, well, what if you didn't have to have your ideal body to be good, to be successful, to be loved? What else could you pursue that's good for your body, good for your soul, good for your relationships, good for your physical health, that's not tied to, do I love my body? Do I think it's the ideal body? Mm, I love that. That's very powerful. Yeah. Now, this is not easy for people to accomplish. <laughs> yeah, much easier preach than practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but I think step one is hearing it, right? Step one is hearing hearing this. And that's why I think it's important that your message is shared again, kind of going back to this age of social media where, you know, I'm, I'm happy that there's a body positivity movement, but it does create kind of like distance for those who, who aren't feeling positive and loving for their body. And so I think this is a really important message for them to hear of, can you work towards just showing your body kindness and work towards neutrality and then work towards, you know, perhaps acceptance and to perhaps get help in that process too. And, you know, I think this also, when, when we're speaking of bodies and body neutrality or acceptance of our size, our shape, our weight, and kind of separating who we are as a person and our identities and things that 
bring us happiness in this world from, from the physical body. This kind of translates nicely into another movement that we are seeing that I know you both work closely in that's called the, you know, health at every size or, or haze. And now as, as a dietitian, I'm, I'm very well aware of this movement now, but when I was in school training to become a dietitian, like this, this was not a thing. And I mean, I'm not in school now, so I don't know if they're teaching it, but I, I don't think so. So yeah, Dr. Wassenaar, could you tell us a bit about what health at every size is? And is it just, again, I'm, I'm a little bit thinking what other people are thinking. Is it just this like fad thing or is it founded in science? So I think, you know, your experience, Lindsay, of not hearing about this in your training is so common. And Meredith and I have had this discussion of, of so many times that, you know, these are such important ideas and they, I think, we're not are not well taught in school when people are training when people are learning how to care for people in their various settings as physicians or therapists or dietitians and also you know it really is a movement that is founded in both you know wanting to really examine what we know and look at what we accept as evidence and also in principles of social justice and in principles of inclusion and so you know it really is a movement that strives to question what we have accepted to be true about health and size and drive for thinness and, you know, equating certain weights or certain body sizes or shapes with health. And then conversely equating other sizes or other shapes or weights with unhealthiness and really trying to say, now, is that actually true? And do we actually have the science to back up those assumptions or can we be more open-minded about what health is? Can we really examine what the science is telling us about the importance of self-acceptance, of treating people with equity and fairness and inclusion, and how that impacts health outcomes. And, you know, a large part of this that Meredith and I have also spoken of so often is the trauma that's associated with being discriminated against based on size or shape and the trauma that we all carry in our bodies related to a society that overvalues size and shape. And so, you know, the Hayes movement is is really... I think, rooted in some very, very important ideas and principles and some important ways of re-examining what we thought we knew. Right. Because what we thought we knew <laughs> is, is, you know, and, and we always, I always, as a dietitian and just somebody who respects science, I think it's important to remember that science is always evolving, you know, <laughs> And we we might say this is a fact. It's been proven. Well, there's going to be new research, you know, as well. So science is always evolving and changing. But you know what what we thought we knew was was that you know health risks and chronic diseases might increase with body weight, and this is where kind of this push about BMI and body mass index or these these standard numbers and the standardized equation of a weight to height ratio was was developed and really started categorizing people as normal body weight, underweight, overweight, or obese. And it's really interesting to me the harm that even just using these words creates for people. And I've had the the privilege, I guess you call her the ease, the luck of being what is classified by BMI standards as a normal body weight. But I can't even begin to imagine the stigmas associated if you were classified outside of, of that. And I think this is really becoming a problem in our medical community. These are the stories I hear and what I'm kind of seeing around me. You know, if somebody goes into the doctor's office and gets weighed, which is a whole issue in and of itself, and then that that doctor, and this by no means, you're a doctor, I'm not criticizing doctors, I'm just giving an example here, might then start treating the person based off this BMI, this category, instead of the underlying and root issues. So I'd, I'd love to hear, it. you know, is, is this being addressed in the medical community? Are we ready to throw BMI out the window or... Is it going to take a lot longer? You know, I think that it it 
it, there are places in the medical com community that people are starting to ask these questions and really wonder about the sort of pieces of objective data, what we've considered to be objective data that that we thought was so informative. So, so definitely it is a growing space. And there are more and more people wanting to have this conversation. We are a long way away from really sort of turning over some of this history. And, and I think that, you know, really what it comes down to is making sure that we when we have a piece of, of data that we're we're using it in the right way and with the right limits. And, you know, so much of the sort of like evidence that we thought we had gathered over time, you know, we took this one piece of data that was very concrete, BMI, you know, it's a, it's a number that doesn't get more, you know, right. concrete than that. In a box than that. Yeah. That is <laughs> yep. And then we extrapolated from there that, you know, this must mean all of these things because of this number. And so let's change this number and then we can change all of these things. And, you know, that just doesn't hold true. And also it is a, there's a long history to undo. I love the way that you just said that so simply of, of how ridiculous it is to assume that if we change the number, all these other conditions might change as well. And I think that in in my interpretation of health at every size, it's reminding the people and the healthcare practitioners that we are per pursuing health and it can be pursued regardless of size, regardless of weight, regardless of BMI. And, and pursuing health is the goal. Now, there's another tricky question for you guys, though, too, is how do we even define health sometimes, right? I have this conversation with my clients all the time. And, and what I've come up with, and I'd, again, love to hear maybe, Meredith, your perspective, but is, th is that it is an individualized pursuit, you know, that health really is what does health mean to you? Are you living the life that you want? Is Are you able to, you know move your body in the way that you want, spend time with your family in the way that you want, think in the way that you want. How how do you navigate, Meredith, when people are coming to you and saying like, but I just want to be healthy? Like, how do you navigate that question or yeah, that question with them? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, I so appreciate the conversation about the medical community. I think Dr. Wasson and I are so, we so enjoy working together because we get both pieces of the puzzle. And I think the important thing about the medical community is that that information then bleeds out into our larger social systems. And so when you have folks who are socialized from a very young age that, you know, they go to the doctor every year and they, for their well child check and they're shown their growth curve and where they are on their growth curve and where they're expected to be. And, you know, having those conversations from such a young age in families and medical offices, we have very deeply ingrained ideas of what, weight means and especially what weight means in relation to health. So folks will come in, you know, for family therapy, for individual therapy, for coaching, and we'll say, you know, it's often, more often in my experience with my practice, it's family members who are saying, well, but we don't want this person to weight restore too much, or this person is in a larger body, why isn't weight loss part of their treatment plan? You know, we want them to be healthy, we're concerned about their health. And the conversation that I have with them very often is, well, what does health mean to you? How do you define that? Because I find that when we look at intergenerational patterns, that's really where we start to understand how people develop their idea of health. For some families, health is very tangible. It is visual. You can look at someone and know if they're healthy or not. Now, we as professionals know that that's not accurate. That's not true. We can't look at someone and know their health behaviors, their health status. But for some families, that's very true of their family system. And so when we expand that idea and we say, well, what about relational health? Are you able to go enjoy meals with friends and family? Or are you so consumed about what food will be there, who's prepared it, what ingredients they've used, how much you're expected to eat in front of others that you can't tolerate that? What about, you know, physical health markers that are greatly impacted by stress? Things like monitoring calories, weight cycling, relational stress, increase your cortisol, which likely leads to weight gain for a lot of people. And so when we're looking at what pieces of the puzzle do you have that make you healthy, 
there is no one determinant. That's, you know, we have this category of things that we call the social determinants of health, and there are many of them. So we have to look at all of these pieces of the puzzle and also consider, you know, oppression and privilege in that. If you're someone who lives in a food desert and you don't have access to unprocessed food, whatever that is, or, you know, if you are very low income and you don't always have food on the table, looking at who has access to healthcare, folks in larger bodies who've had a lot of trauma in the medical community often don't seek out healthcare. And so looking at all of these different pieces that go into what does health mean for you and knowing that because all of the pieces of the puzzle are different for every single one of us, there is no one size fits all approach to health. And when we're having conversations with people, there's always going to be something that they can do to improve their health. Now, whether or not it's the thing that they think will improve their health, that's more of the conversation piece that we have. But because everything's individualized and it's different for all of us, there's always some change that we can make somewhere in one of those social determinants of health to pursue that goal. Well, and I love that you just said that, you know, uh, that there's probably something you can do to improve your health that, you know, that's what most, most of us can improve our lives in some way, shape or form. And that, you know, as you're treating these clients and patients of yours, that you're on their side. I do want you to improve your health. Just might not be in, in the way that you're thinking, because in our, definitely in our Western society, we're so ingrained, just as you were already explained and just believing that like, weight or shape or size determines health. And so I think you're really expanding people's mind and saying, no, I'm on your side. I want you to improve your health, but there's other ways, better ways to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what that means for you. I think that's an important thing for health at every size providers or people who are interested in practicing from this approach to know is that it's not my job as a health at every size therapist to look at my client and say, this is the one way, the truth, the light, this is going to make your life better. It's my job as a therapist to be curious and to ask questions and find out what is, what's happening here. How is your disordered eating or your belief about body weight, size, shape? How is that serving you? Because humans love patterns. We love things that make sense. And so there's a function to everything. And you have to do a little digging sometimes to find out what the function is. And it's not always a productive function. But when we have that conversation and we get curious about that, we can, I can, as a health at every size therapist, offer a different perspective. I'm very upfront with people about the approach that I practice. And it's not for everybody. Not everybody is ready for it. Not everybody is interested in for it, interested in it. But I'm very upfront about the way that I practice and that I am open and want to support my client. That's what I'm there for. And I'm not there to say like, this is the only thing you can do. I'm there to be curious and to kind of walk with you in that journey. And I think this is important to hear too, because I I even think in eating disorder recovery, there's a couple stigmas. I'm just going to tell you some things that I've heard. These statements aren't necessarily of a specific person or of myself, but I've heard people be fearful of of eating disorder recovery because they think that that means, well, I'm just going to have to gain weight and not care about my body size and not care about my health. And I'm just going to have to eat the cake. And it's like, I think it's really important to hear what you're saying, Meredith, of, no, we do care about your health, but that's different. You know, we have to define that first, right? And then I think another uh, fear of that some people have of, of eating disorder recovery is and this is kind of going off a different topic, but of of identity, of losing themselves, because so many people do identify with being healthier, eating a certain way. And have you, Dr. Wassenaar, have you, you know, like you mentioned, eating disorders often can stem from trauma, but I feel like the eating disorder itself can be traumatic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a question. This is just, uh, <laughs> I want people to kind of understand, yeah, it can stem from trauma, but it's like it, it, the, the process of it itself can be traumatic. And this is one hesitancy that people have in even pursuing treatment is this like loss of identity. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, that's the thing that is so, I think, challenging about eating disorders and why it's so important to be able to name them and seek out support when you are, you know, realize that you need treatment. It's because the experience of having an eating disorder really does disrupt the sense of yourself and it it disrupts your sense of identity. And so that your entire self becomes what did I eat today? How many calories? What's the number on the scale? How do I look in this size gene, et cetera? And so this sort of way then takes away all of the other parts of your identity, takes away all the other things that make you interesting as a human being that you can find joy in life with. And eating disorders make your world smaller and smaller and smaller until you know, the only thing that you can really think about is your experience with your body and with the food that you eat or don't eat and what you do with that food. And so it can be really scary when you talk to people about giving that up and saying, you know, I actually want to challenge you that you are worth so much more than a number on a scale or a calorie total at the end of the day. And we can explore together who you will be without your eating disorder. But eating disorders make it very scary for people to think about that. So it's a it's a really challenging process and the process of just having an eating disorder and trying to seek out recovery and get help from it in and of itself is often very traumatic for people because it is so incredibly disruptive. It's it's so anxiety provoking and and it is so unsettling. Yeah. And yet when you get to the other side of it, right? <laughs> and everybody's eyes just got big there. When you get to the other side of it, um, I really like how you just said that like eating disorders make your world really small. Cause when you do recover and you do get to the other side of this, it's like the you know, you can go live your life now and you have so much. And and I think that's an opportunity to discover who you are and figure that out and find an identity that really makes peace in your heart and in your soul and in your mind. I think that eating disorders are so, no, I think, I know that eating disorders are so rooted in shame and in atonement for shame. And so when we conceptualize eating disorders that way, that we are ashamed of our bodies, that we are ashamed of the space that we're taking up in the world, we're ashamed of how we're living our lives, that on the other side of that, all of the brain space and the life space and the world space that you regain is just in, invaluable. Being able to go out to dinner with friends and in, be present and enjoy conversation and enjoy community, you know, to be able to be, to have deep, close, intimate relationships where your eating disorder is not kind of this wall between you and other people. Being able to let go of that shame and really embrace who you are, how your body is, and giving yourself the opportunity to be able to do other things other than focus on perfecting your body, whatever that means for you. You know, where we get so wrapped up in that and feeling so much shame about that, that when we can let that go, we can do so many other things that you we never thought that you would be able to pursue because you can't see the the giant world and the giant life because the eating disorder is, is so close and it's so, you know, it's like having blinders on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now I'm curious how your treatment or all, I know there's eating recovery centers all across America, but how has treatment of eating disorders changed in light of the pandemic? And I'm sure you've had to do a lot of virtual things and I have a virtual practice and I think there's a lot of benefits to virtual, which is, you know, you don't have to get dressed up and and you can uh, do it from the comfort of your home. But I think we're all really missing connection for sure. And I think with such uh, a thing as like the work that you guys do, how has that changed your your treatment? So, you know, I think that 
this last year has been such an incredible learning experience <laughs> for all of us and opened opportunities. Uh, and so we've been able to expand into the virtual space with some of our intensive outpatient programming, which has been incredibly valuable for reaching people in places where they may not be able to otherwise get to treatment or they live rurally or they have family obligations that, but they can sign on to a computer a couple of hours a night. And that is the thing that really allows them to access treatment. And on the other side of that, as you stated, you know, with, with treating eating disorders, there's so much importance about being able to be there in person. And so for people at higher levels of care who need more intensive treatment, and especially if they have nutritional instability or medical instability, to be able to be in a space where uh, you can be protected from disease and, and we wear masks all day long and, and things like that, but still get the treatment that you need for your eating disorder is, is just so important. I think, you know, the thing about this pandemic that has shown to be true and I think is going to continue to be just really important is that there are a lot of people who are really, really struggling. There are a lot of people who are really sick. And this experience has really, you know, intensified people's isolation, people's lack of uh, control of the world, lack of routine. Uh, for some people, it has threatened their ability to have food regularly because they can't get to grocery stores or kids can't go to school. And so we are just seeing an incredible number of people suffering and struggling with eating disorders and people who are very, very ill. Mm -hmm. Things that have lain latent for a while or have kind of flown under the radar for a while as I'm my role with eating recovery center is that I supervise our clinical response team. So what that means is that I'm supervising a team of folks who are and myself and I'm taking the first line of calls. When people call in and they say, Hey, I'd like to seek treatment. I'm having those conversations. My team is having those conversations. And the trend that we're seeing is, you know, when we say, well, when did this start? Folks are saying in March of 2020, when when I stopped being able to go to school, when I stopped being able to go into the office, when I stopped being able to see my friends, you know, I wasn't able to participate in sports and I became really concerned about gaining weight. So I began restricting calories or I began, you know, exercising four hours a day because I had all of this extra time on my hands. I think it really just goes to show that this lack of connection that we're all experiencing in this kind of global trauma is really impacting folks who, you know, perhaps were subclinical before and now are really have kind of crossed that boundary into clinical eating disorder because their support system, their distraction, you know, the things that made their life larger were no longer an option. I think that's something that I'm, I'm hearing a lot. And I'm, I'm seeing it too, you know, in my email inbox, I'm seeing newsletters and updates from publications that just eating disorders are skyrocketing during this time. And I, it it's sad, but it comes at no surprise because of all of those reasons that we are all feeling and experiencing. So it's, it's tragic and, and understandable that this is happening. And it's so wonderful that you guys have adapted and found a way to provide virtual treatment as well as in person under, you know, proper precautions. Yeah. I kind of want to go back a little bit. I've been jumping all over the place because it's just such a pleasure having the two of you talk. <laughs> this is just so great. But I want to go back for a moment and and just highlight one more time, like body diversity and especially in the space of, of eating disorders. I think there are some stigmas that eating disorders are, you know, with very thin or underweight people. Is this true? This is not true. <laughs> and this is such an important myth to dispel. All eating disorders can affect people in all sizes and shapes of bodies. And there, you know, there is not a rule that eating disorders are, you know, only in people who are very underweight. And in fact, we see a tremendous amount of eating disorders in people of all sizes and shapes and people who are not necessarily showing up as malnourished, you know, and, and very underweight are being missed. And so then are more ill when they do actually make it into treatment. And I think, you know, it is, it is just so important that people recognize that no matter what number you have on the scale, you absolutely can have an eating disorder. And so Eating Recovery Center is welcoming to all, all people, 
no matter what we might present on the outside, you're really treating people on on the inside with their medical, nutritional, and psychological help to get them to be, you know, truly find find true health for themselves and figure out what that is. Yeah. And I think with regard to body diversity, and this is Dr. Wasser has probably heard me say this 10,000 times, but body diversity is so important because there's kind of this myth that, you know, with the obesity epidemic, and I'm doing air quotes with the obesity epidemic, that larger body sizes are new. This has never been a thing before. And it's a huge problem. And what we know, and there's so much evidence for this, what we know is that folks in all kinds of bodies have existed for millennia. And so when you go back and you look at ancient Rome, ancient Greece, you know, ancient Africa, when you go back and you look at like art that we found from those time periods or writings that we found from those time periods, we know that body diversity has always been present. And so when we operate from that lens, that your body is not a problem, your body is not an anomaly, your body is not anything other than what it's trying to do for you, which is survive. When we look at things from that perspective, we're able to zoom in on what are the behaviors that are a problem? What are the medical issues that are a problem? What are the nutrition issues that are a problem? What are the psychological issues that are a problem? Instead of just looking at kind of this one dimensional view of someone and saying like, oh, your body is this size, so you must have this problem. Or your body is this size, so you must have this problem. We can be so much more open and so much more curious and really treat, meet people where they are and and treat them as individuals rather than assuming that we know everything about them from one look. Yeah, your body is not the problem. I think that also not only have all different bodies existed throughout time, but diet culture and and the culture of dieting or pursuit of thinness or losing weight that we're in right now, you know, Diet cultures have existed in other times as well, but they might have been different. And I think that's important too. You know, I, I, you know, even just a couple centuries ago, I think that, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, sometimes thinness was even seen as not desirable, right? Where from a female perspective, women might not be able to, you know, have a family, or maybe you didn't come from a family of wealth that had an abundance of food. And so even just this whole concept, not only have bodies, different types of bodies always existed throughout time, but just a recognition that there's been various different cultures and stigmas throughout time. So what is present today, what we're dealing with today is not inherently, you know, the truth, right? This pursuit of the thin ideal is is not an ideal. It's just what we're what we're seeing and faced with in this moment in time. Mm-hmm. Well, and when you think about too, that gives us a lens to look at folks who, again, going back to this term, like subclinical, or folks who have like other specified feeding or eating disorder, or they don't meet that diagnostic criteria, they can still struggle with disordered eating, or even if their ideal isn't the thin ideal. They can have, like with athletes, athletes can have a body ideal that can be very detrimental or disruptive to their life that's not being thin. It could be, I need to work out eight hours a day and gain X amount of muscle, and I'm hyper-focused on that, and my whole world shrinks to encompass that. That can be disordered eating. It's not just about, you know, looking at how thin we can be. We can look at you know, all of the ideals with things like people face tuning pictures and videos on Instagram to make their waist smaller and their hips bigger or their chest bigger. And how do we manipulate our bodies, you know, visually in different ways that then become the ideal that's not necessarily being fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what I'm seeing, obviously working with athletes often it's, and such an overlap in what you might call an eating disorder or an exercise addiction. And they're all jumbled up, but it might not necessarily be driving to a number on the scale, like you mentioned, but but more so drive just my world is narrowed down into the pursuit of one thing. And it's causing I think I like really like how you phrased it, like behavioral changes that are hurting us in other 
in other lenses, right? So I know that disordered eating is very prevalent among the athletic population. And is there a space for athletes to walk through the doors at Eating Recovery Center? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is. And, and we, I mean, we, we do, we treat people coming from all walks of life with all different kinds of concerns related to disordered eating or a disordered experience of being in their body. And, you know, I think that with athletes, you know, on on one hand, we can sometimes see people who become so focused on a goal that they are trying to get a number on a scale or a certain amount of body fat percentage that they can end up it can be detrimental to their performance. And we can talk to them about the fact that they can't be a good athlete if they are engaged in this disordered eating or um, these disordered patterns. On the other hand, sometimes we see people who, in fact, their body is performing very, very well, but their life is very small. And so, you know, it's not just that you are losing your ability to be an athlete or losing your performance, although that is true for a lot of people, if you keep at it for long enough, you may actually be performing at a pinnacle of your athletic ability, but you have nothing else. And that is also a very small and a very disordered life. And so really uh, helping people to find the balance and be able to use their body the way they want to in the pursuit of their goals and maybe, you know, their athletic performance, but also, as Meredith mentioned, have relationships that are healthy and satisfying, find joy of being in their body, live without, you know, without pain, enjoy food, celebrate birthdays with their family members, things like that, that really lead to a full and rich life. And I think to tag on to that, this, uh, there's this kind of common thought in the general population, I think, about who qualifies for eating disorder treatment? Who needs treatment? What's the what's the line of I need treatment and I'm fine? And something that's very common, and especially in the age of COVID, when you think about travel barriers, people not wanting to fly, people not wanting to drive, people not wanting to be in person with other people. I've had a lot of conversations with people around, you know, what does sick enough mean? And a lot of folks will say, well, my labs are fine. My weight is fine. Medically, I'm fine. And then we have conversations and, you know, we're talking about how low their intake is or how their relationships have been damaged or how, you know, they can't function in work or school because they're so brain starved or because they're feeling so much shame for other behaviors that they're doing. And so when we're really looking at who needs treatment, I always say, Everyone needs treatment. Everyone deserves treatment. I am the biggest proponent of everyone needs therapy. But deeper than that, in in terms of eating disorders, it really is about your holistic experience of your life and your body as part of your life, not just, you know, oh, my, my labs are bad or I needed to go to the emergency room, but really how are all areas of your life impacted? And I would say if even one area of your life has been impacted by your relationship with food and your body and you want to change and you want to see that be different and improve, that you deserve treatment, whether that is at the outpatient level, the inpatient level, or anywhere in between. I 100% agree with you. I think everybody deserves to learn how and, and be comfortable in their body and to fuel their body and enjoy that and live life to the fullest. And that kind of brings me maybe to one of my final questions for you both, because we've been speaking of eating disorders, but then Meredith, as you said, everybody deserves treatment. Everybody needs therapy. You know, I guess what, in in your words, how do you distinguish between, or what, what do you distinguish between eating disorder and disordered eating and and here's the funny question. As I have conversations with people, some people are like, does everybody have disordered eating? And I say, no, because I, I don't. So so I think there's a, there's absolutely, there's a norm, n- normalized, air quotes, eating, disordered eating and eating disorder. And could you kind of differentiate the two? And is there space for that disordered eating at the eating recovery center as well? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and I I think it's, it really is so much of a spectrum. And when we are looking at these eating patterns or behavioral patterns and how much they are impacting the rest of your life. And so, you know, I think that it is, you know, I, I, I would challenge, I think everyone has some sort of quirky eating behavior, you know, like things that they eat that they're sort of like, you know, this is, this is a little strange, or maybe this is disordered, but it doesn't impact my life. And if someone were to come in and say, you know, 
Dr. Wasner, there's cake up in the lounge for the March birthdays. Come have cake with us. And I can get up and go have cake because we're celebrating together. So, you know, it's, it's having the flexibility to be able to enjoy food, respond to opportunities and recognize that your maybe your quirky eating habits are in their rightful place and your body is nourished and your brain is nourished and your relationships are healthy. And then when you start to get into the spectrum of your disordered eating um, is, you know, you're pretty rigid with it and it actually impacts your ability to be in relationships and it's impacting your psychological wellness. Those are people that I absolutely would say, you know, I think it's worth having a conversation about whether or not you would benefit from treatment and at what level. And there is space at Eating Recovery Center for people who may not agree that they have an eating disorder, but their disordered eating patterns or their behavioral patterns around trying to change the shape of their body, size or shape is impacting their lives. And I actually have a lot of conversations with people about whether or not they have a diagnosis of an eating disorder. And and that is an important part of treatment because, you know, a lot of people don't really realize how much their disordered eating has begun to impact their life. And they may not realize it until someone challenges them on it and says, you know, what happens if you don't work out for not just today, but also tomorrow and the next day? What if you go a weekend without working out? And then you realize how much this has actually impacted your life. So I think that, you know, there is room for people to ask that question here and get help here, even if they don't know if they have an eating disorder. And I think that's a kind of a good space to maybe put this in here. If you're not sure you have an eating disorder, if you're not sure if you need treatment, we, my team, the clinical response team is a team of clinicians and trained staff members that you can call in and have a conversation with. And we can let you know what we offer in your area, in your state. We can talk you through you know, some of the things that you're experiencing and give you a little bit of guidance of what your options might be. And that's free. So you can always call us. The number is 303-825-8595. And so if you're, you know, if you're struggling, I would encourage you to reach out and just have a conversation. I always tell folks that everything starts with a conversation and that there's, you don't have to commit to treatment on day one. You can get your feet wet a bit at a time and get a little bit more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Beautiful. And thank you for giving that plug for the phone number to call. We'll include that in the show notes. And is there a website as well that people should go to if they are curious to learn more or maybe seek treatment for themselves? Yes, it is www.eatingrecovery.com. And if you don't struggle with an eating disorder, but you're struggling with mental health in general, we also have our Pathlight programming. And that website is www.pathlightb as in boy, h as in hairy.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Meredith and Dr. Westnar, for joining me today to have this super important conversation. Thank you for all the work that you do for your clients and the lives that you save at Eating Recovery Center. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. I really hope you enjoyed that episode and thanks for listening. But before I let you go, I have free resources that you can have access to right away, right now, so that you can start fueling your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. First, I have your Red S Recovery Race. If you've ever wondered if you might be struggling with Red S, curious to learn more or know you have red s and are looking to recover fast then you can head to www.riseupnutritionrun.com slash red s and download the red s recovery race see how you place and figure out the next steps to recovery plus while there i have a few other great resources for you including three nutrition secrets that every elite athlete swears by and access to our private Facebook community, Female Athlete Nutrition. So again, to gain access to all of this, head to riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S, that's backslash R-E-D-S, and you can gain access and get the help you need fast. Too many girls and women and female athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer. Become fierce, fit, and fueled. Links in the show notes, and I'll see you next time.